and might bring some kind of a new thoughts to the conservation doctrine. I hope that this more than 30 experts that have participated in these um, conversations and this forum uh, during the conference over the three days are at the threshold of a new theory. And production of theories in any science and science of heritage is the science as any other, makes that science alive. So any kind of a opposing something that has already been um, established as a theory, developing it, uh, uh, juxtaposing, and in fact, uh, developing discussion about the new approaches is something that gives a life to the branch that we are diving in. This concluding session, in fact, is opportunity to make a summary of uh, all the five sessions that we have had and to um, draft the, some kind of a roadmap or way forward concerning the approach to reconstruction of heritage in integrated post-trauma recovery. I will, um, I'm so uh, uh, privileged to chair the session with uh, such esteemed panelists as the uh, chairs of the sessions are, and also the uh, core team of the organization of this, um, conference from Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. So uh, I will start with introducing the panelists and uh, I will, um, I, I have two questions for each of the panelists. Uh, I will start with the uh, first question and the first round of questions. Uh, and I would like to ask our panelists to um, try to give the answer in maximum five minutes of a time. Marie-Laure Lavenir, the chair of the first session, is Director General of ECOMOS. Her mission is to support and develop ECOMOS presence and the engagement across the world in particular as an advisory body to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee for the implementation of World Heritage Convention. After a start in the banking and the SAT management industry, Marie Lord then pursued a career in the management of nonprofit organizations and in fundraising. She was Secretary General of University Foundation until 2015, then she joined ECOMOS. As a consultant, she shares her experience with diverse cultural and educational institutions. Mario Lor, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself and the approach to your own work and the projects through your personal story or personal perception concerning the rights-based approach versus the notion of authenticity in relation to cultural trauma processing and heritage reconstruction in a five minutes, if possible. And thank you very much, Amra. It's a, it's a very interesting and very complex question indeed. In fact, uh, based on my experience and projects I, I followed, I, I would like to give two answers or to say two things. The first one on the basis of the case study project carried out by ECOMOS in partnership with ICROM, to which reference has been made already several times. And regarding authenticity, one of the main lessons learned from the cases that we studied together is that restitution of physical or visual characteristics very frequently takes a priority over adherence to conservation principles regarding, to authentic regarding authenticity of materials and techniques. So 
what we can say is that authenticity is often not a concept in itself in popular or official understandings. And it's not self-evident at all. And it requires a lot of intensive dialogue to establish its meaning or, or at least a meaning for, for the case uh, in, in practice. And my second point is it would be more general and more based on my experience, ECOMO's experience as advisory body to the World Heritage Committee. And it's about the relationship between the rights-based approach and perhaps not only authenticity, but more broadly outstanding universal value, authenticity being one of the three pillars of uh, outstanding universal value as uh, often said. And I, I think it's uh, important to acknowledge that the World Heritage Convention is based on two principles that express uh, competing aspirations. On one side, and since its adoption in 72, the World Heritage Convention is based on the principle of universality, which is its political and philosophical foundation. And it's expressed through the key concept of outstanding universal value precisely. But on the other one, the World Heritage List is expected to express and reveal the cultural diversity of, uh, as the essence of mankind. <laughs> So this principle of cultural diversity has been developed in the NARA document, for instance, and it, counts, it constitutes the founding base for uh, rights-based approaches concerning heritage and heritage values in, in particular. And what I want to say is that the articulation between these two competing aspirations is complex and it's challenging and perhaps even more nowadays as we can observe a certain tendency towards um, fragmentation of rights. This is not specific to heritage, as we can see that this fragmentation and the difficulty to accommodate it with universality affects other very important uh, current debates. So that would be my word, Amra. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, so important. I would like now to um, welcome Dr. Rohit Jigyasu, uh, who um, was a chair of our second session. Uh, Dr. Rohit is a conservation architect and risk management professional from India, currently working at ICROM as project manager on urban heritage, climate change, and disaster risk management. What can be more important than that? Mm -hmm. Rohit held the NESCO chair at the Institute for Disaster Mitigation of Urban Cultural Heritage at um, Ritz, Ritsumeikan University, Kyoto, Japan, where he was instrumental in developing and teaching the international training course on disaster risk management or cultural heritage. He has served as both president of ICOMOS India and president of ICOMOS International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness, ICORP. Before joining ICROM, Rohit worked a number of national and international organizations, including UNESCO, uh, UN, ISDR, the Getty Conservation Institute, and the World Bank, providing consultancy, research, and training on disaster risk management of cultural heritage. Of course, this is just a summary. I have skipped a lot of uh, uh, titles, tasks, and uh, achievements that Rohit uh, has made in his life. And um, it is really a pleasure to ask a person that is uh, competent to uh, inform us about the, in fact, the, the notion of resilience that has become probably, resilience is the key word, has become a key word, not only in heritage studies during recent two to three years recently, but in other fields of human lives. So the notion of resilience in relation to cultural trauma processing and heritage reconstruction is, in, is extremely important and probably one of the uh, uh, top priority topics, not to 
be, to remain in the sort of domain of plastic words. It is important to give the meaning and the implementation of the measures that are uh, 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 empowering people to build resilience through um, heritage protection or heritage conservation practices. What I am extremely interested in is how to make the very process of recovery resilient. Are there some kind of a, um, uh, actions or the methods or the ideas how the very process of recovery can become resilient? Because we have been testifying uh, the very often that the uh, uh, societies are um, facing the relapse, conflict relapse. And that, of course, affects heritage. Thank you, Amra. Thank you very much, first of all, for your very generous uh, introduction, which embarrasses me. But anyways, uh, so uh, to answer your question, um, I think uh, when we have to think about making recovery resilient, first thing for us is to understand what do we mean by resilience. Uh, unfortunately, like many words, including sustainability, resilience is also becoming a kind of jargon a kind of uh, a word that you throw left, right, and center without really understanding what we really mean. So I think your question is very pertinent. Uh, I will start by giving you an example of how resilience can be misinterpreted or misused um, mainly by politicians because they also you know, catch hold of very good words and use them as they, as they find it convenient. So I just give you an example from my own country in Mumbai, uh, which is a big city, faces floods every year. And then very conveniently politicians say, well, the people of Mumbai are very resilient because they are suffering from floods every year and they have no choice but to suffer and survive. So to, to kind of give them a kind of a title of resilience sometimes can be very misused. Uh, That's the first thing I wanted to really mention. And having said that, I would say by resilience, uh, we should look at recovery not as a short-term goal, but in a long-term perspective. The problem is that we start thinking of recovery, we think of it as an end product. You know, We will do recovery and then we'll move on. But actually what we end up is we create a kind of context within which long-term development processes are impacted. And if we are not mindful of doing recovery in a way that the long-term processes also make you uh, recover, not only recover, but have a, a, a context which is more sustainable, where the human lives are given more dignity, where there is uh, improvement in the quality of health, where all the human development indicators are improving, you know. So resilience to, my, me, to me is something that you must consider in recovery process so that your recovery can lead to something more long-term sustainable. You are not going to end up creating something which may look visually nice, which may uh, maybe tick, you, you know, tick mark all the boxes to say that you have done recovery, but have you made people really um, enabled, enabled people? Have you created enabling mechanisms? Have you enabled governance to be better? Have you enabled, uh, people, all kinds of people with different backgrounds to have equal voice in, in making decisions? Have you enabled uh, your heritage to be not symbolic, but something which is representative of all sections of the society? Have you in ensured that your recovery has uh, is not just limited to physical uh, fabric, but it, it kind of connects deeply to the spiritual and the social connection that people have with it, you know? So if we ensure that in the recovery process, then we will make sure that after the recovery is complete, we are able to have a long-term uh, sustainable development situation where people will, it will be, it will be an improvement on what was there before. So that comes me comes to the last point I want to mention, and that is that recovery is not about going back to what you were before uh, any disaster. You know, we always think that you need to go back to pre-disaster situation. But actually, pre-disaster situation or pre-conflict situation 
actually has a lot of factors that created vulnerability for that conflict to happen in the first place. So if you are not addressing those factors that created vulnerability, after recovery, you will go back to the same vulnerability factors and the same conflict will be generated maybe in a different way, you know. So being resilient to me also means that it is an, looking at recovery as an opportunity to make fundamental changes so that you reduce those vulnerabilities and you are not going to go back to where you were before the conflict began, but you are going to spiral up to a situation which is much better, much more uh, where, your, uh, where your vulnerabilities have been reduced and your capacities have been enhanced. So that's what I would say is resilience in true sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rohit. Um, it's extremely important that this word resilience uh, loses it, its plasticity and uh, gets and, and that becomes charged with a meaning that we understand with a concrete meaning. I also, um, you know, when I'm listening to you, I agree with everything, but the communities, the societies and people individuals who are struck with a, a, any kind of disaster and this usually uh, who are struck with the crisis, what is cumulative effect of different disasters that are going on either succeeding each other or uh, superimposing over each other, they are too weak to develop their own resilience. So I think the use of word resilience, building resilience, in the societies that are uh, 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 struck with a disaster is some kind of a global responsibility and some kind of a, um, the issue of um, solidarity that has to be developed across the globe. My, um, uh, the, the next uh, speaker, next panel is, is uh, Professor Trevor Marchand, uh, who is a Merit Professor of Social Anthropology at SOAS, University of London, and recipient of the Royal Anthropological Institute Rivers Memorial Medal. He studied architecture, received a PhD in anthropology, and qualified as a fine woodworker London's Building Crafts College. Trevor has conducted fieldwork with craftspeople around the world and published extensively, including the monographs, Minaret Building and Apprenticeship in, ja in Yemen, The Masons of Jannah, The Pursuit of Pleasurable Work, that is his uh, book recently released. Uh, he was a member of the Ecomos World Heritage Panel in 2020-2021 and is an advisor to Alif and the Arcadia's Endangered Wooden Architecture Program at Oxford Brooks, where he is presently guest lecturer in the School of Architecture. Uh, I have had the pleasure to work with Trevor uh, at the uh, uh, e-commerce ECROM project um, case study and um, that's a sort of one of these um, lucky situations in one's life to meet a person like Professor Martian. And, uh, Professor Martian, I in fact would like to ask you, uh, you know, while working on this project and while working on a editing the book, um, I, uh, the, one of the most um, striking um, cases or the situations was the one in Yemen. Um, Yemeni people, such a kind of luxury of a heritage uh, and history and uh, such a, a complex crisis that they are facing with. So um, we are losing Yemeni. Uh, heritage in every instance of time because of the uh, different kind of natural hazards that are becoming more frequent every year and because of the armed conflicts, very complex armed conflicts going on there. 
So everything is a supper, a supper imposing over each other and people are suffering and the heritage is being lost. Uh, having in mind your experience and the part of your life spent there working with the masters, building masters and masons in Yemen, I would like to ask you uh, the, the following question. In future efforts to empower the Yemeni population in recovering and reconstructing their heritage resources, what role might the Masons play? And um, how do you see this uh, traditional sort of transmission, knowledge transmission process in, the, in these crafts and it's um, a possibility of its, of its recovering? Thank you, Amra. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction. And I, I, I must return the, um, I had such a pleasure meeting you and working with you on the Ecomos ICRAM project. Um, it was very, very special. And I hope that we'll have opportunity to work again together in the future. I also want to thank Mary Lore for her um, initial intervention. And um, I thought that the uh, the second point that Mary Lore raised about this, this bubbling tension um, between universal rights and also the concept of world heritage. I think it's extremely important and one probably worthy of a very dedicated um, investigation by all of us. Um, it shouldn't be something that's just on the shoulders of you know, the directors of organizations like ECOMOS or ECRUM, but really I think it's something that's pertinent to us all um, who are in the field. And um, thank you, Rohit, too, for your, um, for your intervention. In fact, I think Yemen represents uh, a very long case of recovery, and it's, it, it hasn't even really yet started. Um, perhaps it doesn't even have a starting date, um, who knows. But I've in, I knew what Amra was going to ask me um, to some extent, and so I've just put together a few illustrations to, uh, to share with you. Um, to just give you a sense of, um, of what's going on in the country, although I'm sure you're all very aware of it. You're all very aware of the fact that conflict and humanitarian suffering continues in Yemen on a gargantuan scale. Um, and not unlike the Palestinian camps described in session three yesterday, the conflict, violence and displacement experienced by the Yemeni population cannot be seen as an aberration. Rather, instead, it needs to be recognized as, as something that is framing everyday normal life now. The, um, sorry, let me just go back. The war damage to Yemen's monuments, buildings, and infrastructures is enormous. Um, NGOs, foreign funding bodies, and local experts have recognized that moving forward with the rehabilitation of historic sites, whenever that might be possible, will have significant wide reaching socioeconomic benefits and will be seminal to reestablishing national pride and very importantly, a sense of place for the Yemeni people. However, I need to point that out that even during the preceding decades of relative peace and security, and I'm referring here to the 70s, 80s and 90s, conserving Yemen's historic cities was riddled with challenge. In the case of Sana'a, for example, the one that I know best, persistent macro level um, issues included the absence of a fully fledged conservation plan and a legal framework for protecting Sana'a's architectural heritage, as well as a lack of government funding, capacity and commitment, and also unchecked urban expansion and land speculation. But perhaps, and this I think speaks to very much the issues of this um, conference that's been organized, perhaps the thorniest challenge to the smooth running of conservation works in Sana'a and other Yemeni cities was the radical change in the pecking order among practitioners that emerged already in the late 1980s. Traditional master masons who for centuries presided unchallenged over both design and construction were progressively sidelined by the new paper professionals 
including foreign and local conservationists, architects, engineers, and contractors. Those hands-on masters were in fact rendered unskilled by new requirements for drawn plans, written specifications, and a scientific approach to managing heritage. The status of master masons was consequently really reduced to that of a contracted laborer. So regardless of that though, the masons themselves are keenly aware of the fact that their knowledge and skills are inseparable from the world heritage that they maintain, conserve and reproduce. Many were proud to work in the old style, but equally proud to build in a neo-traditional style. The masons I worked alongside knew that for possibly millennia, repair work, maintenance, modifications, and reconstruction in Sana were part and parcel of the same process. And that process was fluid and interpretive. This is my last slide. By the late 1990s, when I was still working there with Masons, collaborative projects had begun to better synthesize UNESCO objectives with local ideas and practices. Many Yemeni conservation architects progressively adopted the Masons' creative approach, and the Masons view that heritage and authenticity are not merely properties of objects, which we're all aware of, but rather they are lived in embodied practices and ways of being that are learned, reinterpreted, and embellished by successive generations of craftspeople. After all, historic cities must allow for improvisation and accommodate change in order that architectural heritage be relevant for the present, but also for the future. And I just wanna end with just one last note saying that I think we, it always strikes me that craftspeople are not part of the representation of, of the meetings that we have, or very rarely. I've worked with craftspeople all over the world. They are not mute and they are not inarticulate about what they know how to do. In fact, craftspeople are obviously best placed to tap into the networks that can realize recovery and reconstruction. And in the future, I would very much like to hear more directly from them and have their input at these high level meetings um, and conferences. So I think that would be a step forward. So thank you. Thank you so much, Trevor. And thank you very much for this uh, final input concerning the importance of giving a voice to craftspeople in all these discussions, uh, considerations of how to move forward. <clears throat> I, um, I really understand what does it mean to uh, th that kind of a conflict between the people who were uh, transmitting knowledge to each other through working, learning through hands-on like uh, situations or through hands-on methods, uh, and uh, those who are paper-based, as you say, um, uh, knowledge carriers or uh, knowledge, um, uh, those who bring the knowledge. When I was working in Stolac, for example, the best master for minarets building, he could not read the project. So I had to use a nail and a, a rope to trace at the soil, you know, what in fact I was thinking about and ask him how to do with that. So um, the, the situation is not a local. It is something that I think is universal when we talk about the communities and the masters that sometimes feel ashamed that they do not have this like uh, knowledge that we have, but there is so much to learn from them. And let me now introduce uh, Dr. Azra Akshamia, who is an artist and architectural historian, director of MIT Future Heritage Lab, an associate professor in the Department of Architecture at MIT, and the director of the Art, Culture, and Technology program there. In her multidisciplinary work, Akshamiya investigates the politics of identity and memory. Uh, 
Azra's recent academic research focuses on the representation of Islam in the West and the destruction and restoration of cultural heritage in the Balkans and the MENA region. She received the prestigious Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2013 for her design of the prayer space in the Islamic Cemetery of Altrak, Austria, Austria, and has published widely. Her recent books include Mosque Manifesto, Propositions for Spaces of Coexistence, Museum Solidarity Lobby, and the edited volume Architecture of Coexistence Building Pluralism, and the new uh, sort of edited volume uh, that I hope she will mention, it's really fresh under the press. Uh, Azra was forced to leave her homeland, Bosnia, when she was at the age of a teen, teen uh, and uh, moved to Austria, then to USA, and uh, she, in fact, started her activism, her research of some kind of this uh, restorative impulse uh, through her own experience, introspectively. And this, in fact, somehow prepared her to work with the uh, people who are um, migrants usually those who were forced to leave their homes and uh, homelands, refugees and displaced persons, and those who are somehow in this limbo between the place of origin and some kind of the uh, a place where they are aiming to, always somewhere and nowhere. So uh, the, her projects, which are some kind of art that is activism and um, uh, activism that is uh, expressed through art, something that is researched together with all these two actions together. Uh, Azra is always um, uh, sort of uh, uh, using heritage as a resource for the research, for the activism and for the art. But as I can recognize in her work, this um, sort of restorative impulse that she is expressing is in fact a forcing her to find heritage forms that are not destructible. She will tell us if I am right concerning my perception of her works. And I would like to ask Azra uh, to to introduce herself through her personal stories and projects concerning um, her perception of the mental wound which loss of heritage inflicts to refugees and um, about the alternative ways of satisfying the restorative impulse in an indestructible shape. And to uh, sort of refer to her projects like um, her doctoral thesis, our mosques are us, or portable mosque, or memory matrix, and her work in Al Azraq camp uh, through the memory searches, etc. Azra, please. Thank you so much, Amra, for first of all inviting me to be part of this conference. I have learned so much, and it's, I feel at home, even though I'm kind of operating in slightly different fields, but. This is the discourse that I was kind of working towards from, from the perspective of um, design and, and contemporary art. Um, I would like to share a couple of slides. I think it's easier to uh, talk through some images. Okay. So you see the full, uh, full image, right, of the uh, presentation. Um, so, as Amra mentioned, I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm, uh, I was born in Sarajevo and uh, was forced to leave my home country during the war in the 90s with the whole family. My sister was in America, parents and uh, my brother went to Austria and this experience, but the rest of the family was in Sarajevo. Uh, so I got the glimpse of both experiences of what it means to be in the war and on the other hand also what it means to live 
in exile and, and kind of come to terms to uh, live in different cultural settings that are um, uh, also, you know, at times nurturing, at times very destructive. Um, and this personal experience has informed a lot of my research. So Amra mentioned my doctoral dissertation, which was um, looking into preservation without preservationist, let's say how uh, Bosnian Muslims who suffered the uh, uh, highest extent of both uh, human and cultural heritage losses are coming to terms what happened to them and this massive destruction of cultural heritage, but also genocide uh, that used cultural heritage um, as a vehicle to inflict those mental wounds. And what was interesting there, uh, I mean, I looked at on the one hand, the studies and of experts who looked at the kind of sheer amount of destruction and the types of destructions. Um, but what I discovered in my work was that there was this other layer that uh, went beyond sheer removal of uh, each other's buildings um, and, and icons of uh, ethnic and religious identities of, of those who were identified as enemies. It went beyond just territorial cleansing. This was, at least in Bosnia, also about a certain form of sadism on architecture uh, that was meant to ultimately alienate people to such an extent that would forever extinguish their desire for existence. And that looked like, um, you know, uh, one would just not uh, destroy a mosque, but also burn it, uh, install a pig stall on top of uh, the ruined mosque, carry away the uh, rubble stones and uh, bury them also with the bones of, of the people who were in the, you know, dumped in a mass grave. Uh, and all of that then became a garbage heap over the 20 years afterwards. So there's this, this mixing of bones and stones, which becomes a kind of a, a, a form of mental torture. Uh, and how does one go and what is the response of reconstruction? So kind of um, top down bu uh, bureaucracies and, and um, approaches to conservation, you know, I have difficulty also dealing with the kind of share scale of this destruction. And in many cases, uh, you know, you will have buildings uh, the, of, of significant values being restored. Uh, we all know the famous uh, reconstruction project of the old, Mos uh, old bridge in Mostar. But what do you do with the, all these like over 1,300 little mosques, which were not considered, uh, many of which not considered a significant um, cultural heritage examples. For the people, they mean a lot. and. And in the reconstruction process, the, the kind of imams often function as people who are kind of providing therapeutic means uh, through reconstruction process to kind of heal. Uh, that is very interesting to me. And that is something that is neglected in the um, kind of large um, showcase projects of reconstruction, like the old bridge in Mostar, which was beautifully restored. But again, in this city, the, the coexistence is not restored. And for me, there is this still a question, how do we deal with uh, negotiating this question of uh, material reconstruction and restoring a symbol, but also how do we connect that symbol with the social values and the meanings of this cultural heritage in society? So in this case, in Mostar, in my uh, mind, that uh, social structure part was fully neglected and um, uh, I mean, Bosnia is kind of on the verge of another uh, conflict, and I hope it will not become an armed conflict again. Now, uh, moving to uh, different countries, and uh, actually before I go there, um, one way I found uh, an opportunity to work with these questions it was to use artistic tools like participatory processes to uh, and um, healing capacities of art to provide uh, forms for uh, restoring heritage and living culture, on the other hand, provide a vehicle to um, disseminate voices of those who are affected. So here I worked with Bosnian women who survived torture to collect their stories, but also inform and with these stories, the work of other researchers like Andra Riedlmeier, who was one of the witnesses in the criminal tribunal in The Hague, who share with me his database, I share with him uh, my research and all of that is both disseminated in artistic exhibitions, but also uh, works and brings these stories of people on the ground to The Hague. 
Now, moving to different countries, um, you know, I've experienced uh, another form of instrumentalization of cultural heritage of those migrants and uh, who have lost their homes and their places of worship and uh, signaled not to be welcomed again through the lens of cultural heritage as Islamic heritage perceived offered by the you know, uh, ex right wing extremist as something that doesn't belong uh, to Europe. It's alien to Europe, although, although it has historically cannot be sustained such argumentation. Um, and often uh, this goes in hand in hand with the uh, politicization and anti-mosque uh, protests and, um, and um, a kind of rejection of, um, of uh, those symbols that one doesn't want to have in, in a European landscape. So to address all these, I work with lands of cultural heritage, but also again, participatory processes uh, to talk to people and to create visual means which signal possibilities of simultaneous belonging to different cultural milieus, like this uh, wearable mosque. Uh, I have this whole series of uh, wearable mosque projects that are kind of hybrids. Um, they speak to the transculturality uh, discourse. So our conception of culture that moves beyond of, uh, interculturality and multiculturality uh, discussions to say, well, you know, all of our identities are multi-layered and local and we can um, um, belong to different places. And, and you see that in some of the other designs. And then finally, I want to bring another point that we do need to talk and think about uh, how this conservation discourse uh, is not only working inside of distractions, but also with the people who are on the move, bringing together dimensions of uh, cultural conservation uh, concerns with humanitarian realm. Here we see a lot of um, um, already work done by refugees themselves and we can learn from them. Uh, they build things like this, uh, like the Palmyra Arch in the Al-Azraq refugee camp where someone is signaling a, a different kind of shelter and expressing emotional and cultural needs which obviously are not met by humanitarian architecture. I will leave you at that and I invite you to read the new book that Amra mentioned, uh, Design to Live, Everyday Inventions from a Refugee Camp that we just completed uh, together with uh, Syrian refugees from Azra Camp that documents those voices and showcases how uh, cultural conservation processes could be relevant in the camps themselves and for the population on the move. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azra. Uh, there are so many things to talk about your work and one of my uh, like uh, favorite one that I mentioned into the in the introduction to the book, the volume that I'm editing that is linked with this conference is in fact memory matrix. Mm -hmm. It is uh, uh, extremely important for understanding all these like authorized heritage discourse and the one that goes um, outside of these kind of uh, foci uh, or the sort of uh, flashes that are directed to the monumental sites and the material reconstruction of them. Uh, now I would like uh, to welcome Dr. May uh, Sher. Uh, she has been head of the Arab States Unit at UNESCO World Heritage Center since August 2019. She is a conservation architect with extensive experience in managing projects focusing on the conservation and management of cultural heritage sites. Her previous experience includes working with UNESCO Office for Iraq, the Department of Antiquities of Jordan, and the German Agency for Technical Cooperation and Delivering Courses on Heritage Conservation and Management. May has edited several works and published articles and proceedings on archaeology, conservation, and heritage management. Um, I would kindly ask you, May, to introduce yourself through um, your personal uh, perception or through the project that you have been working on concerning the uh, position of vulnerable groups, especially children, harmed by cultural trauma, how 
do they perceive heritage reconstruction in the post-trauma recovery? How their own trauma, personal and cultural, may be addressed through heritage reconstruction? Thank you, Amra. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and the question and for the invitation again. And I take the opportunity again to thank uh, all colleagues and friends of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage for their kind uh, invitation and support uh, always. Um, I will try to be uh, brief. <laughs> um, I uh, Indeed, I mean, integrated reconstruction involves the engagement of communities and the participation in cultural life and access to cultural heritage. And youth and children are very important to reach out. Their trauma may be addressed through cultural heritage in general, and particularly during the crisis or trauma. And uh, here I think it's even more important during the crisis or the trauma, you know, to address the, the issue of cultural heritage and what it means to them, even before the recovery can start or, or before even reflecting about uh, recovery uh, processes, which can come at the second stage. Uh, one uh, brief example that I can think of uh, now is in relation to one of the activities that we carried out some years ago in Iraq. Uh, it was during the crisis. It was during when, when communities were actually displaced and living in, in camps outside you know, the, the, the cities, towns, or villages. And uh, taking into consideration that these communities uh, really lived uh, close to, to very important cultural heritage uh, uh, sites or, or even uh, towns. And um, it was a small project with respect to the other, you know, uh, more <laughs> bigger project addressing uh, cultural heritage in general, but it focused on awareness raising and promoting the engagement of all stakeholders, uh, particularly youth and children for the protection of cultural heritage. So um, by designing several uh, awareness raising materials targeting different groups, uh, and among these were short videos, games, comic books, as well as board games, featuring cultural heritage stories and challenges, and challenges for protection actually for, for children. And uh, it, it was on the one hand for aware, awareness raising. On the other hand, it was a way to engage displaced communities in, in issues related to cultural heritage, to, to know about the perceptions and also, you know, looking forward, you know, when, when you don't know when, when these communities and they didn't know when they would be able to go back to at least maybe start the engagement and once they return, it might help, you know, maybe in the protection recovery processes and so on. So uh, one activity that was organized, uh, for example, was a cultural heritage play day. And it was organized at one of the camps hosting communities who were internally displaced and had no access to their cultural heritage sites, uh, which obviously they had left uh, behind. And they were watching and reading and, and listening, hearing news about uh, their destruction, basically. And that was really a very difficult period for everyone. I mean, not only the communities, but everyone, basically. Uh, um, all of us in the country, in the region, and everywhere else, I suppose. So after screening some videos and distributing games, uh, very spontaneously, children began to talk themselves about uh, their cultural heritage, uh, how they would stand up for its protection and recovery uh, when they returned to their homes. Uh, they started to tell the stories about that. They were uh, talking that, saying that they will be back there soon. Some was even saying, well, I'll be back in four days, which was a bit, uh, you know, very uh, optimistic. But uh, it was interesting to see how, how they reacted when they saw so the sites they knew in, in the stories that were told in the challenges, you know, we created a hero, a, a small boy, and afterwards we developed it into this hero, you know, and his friends who were trying to protect their heritage. And in the process, uh, how they were, you know, it, there were games about uh, heritage protection and then, you know, understanding, you know, about the history of this site and so on. So it was a way also to maintain the link. So with the reactions, you know, you know, we felt somewhat a message of hope 
on the one hand, uh, and uh, that you know was probably triggered by facilitating this connection with culture and heritage at the time of an ongoing crisis and the ongoing trauma uh, at the time. And um, you know, during times of displacement and how how they reacted, and it was uh, very, in a way, very positive and the future looking, and uh, and they were really looking forward to go back for the cultural heritage, for the protection of cultural heritage, and so on. So this was one of the activities that targeted really very small children. But there were others, for example, uh, you know, where we worked a little bit with the youth and uh, to try to express themselves in artwork, in uh, you know, sculptures, paintings, how they perceive cultural heritage, what it means to them. And they started, you know, when they presented it, you know, in an exhibition, for example, they start talking about it, uh, how important it is to restore the destroyed heritage that they have heard that it was destroyed and so on. So, and, and this small, you know, activity on exercise really opened my eyes about how you know sometimes we forgot about uh, these uh, you know vulnerable groups and um, and this age group but they can be very important actually group on the one hand you know these uh, activities help them maybe perhaps you know as an activity during the trauma and it could help maybe afterwards when they have returned back to their uh, homes and, and to their sites and um, they understand more about the protection uh, of heritage, about the recovery of heritage, and um, they might be, you know, part of the dialogue as well. So uh, this is uh, it, I think, from my side for now uh, to address your question, Amra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, May. And I think it's one of the crucial activities that we have to think about because these children that do not have their personal memories on some kind of physical forms on their home and that live nowhere that have this placelessness that has been following their lives since the uh, since they remember they in fact need some kind of point of belonging in order to be installed in the world, as Mircheliada says. So this point of belonging can be somehow offered to them through this uh, reminding them on their heritage, on the forms that somehow uh, are forms of their home. And at the same time, as Fida Tuman yesterday mentioned in these uh, long-term expulsions, it can somehow freeze the image of the homeland. And they might be unable to recognize it once when they are able to go back. It's an alien land for them. So all of that are challenges. Now let me introduce uh, a person that does not need any kind of introduction, uh, Dr. Monir Bushnyaki, uh, who is uh, one of the members of the team that in fact uh, uh, manages all these, all the, uh, this project and the other projects in uh, Arab Regional Center of World Heritage. Uh, the one that inspires us through his work and his dedication to heritage across the world. He's currently an advisor to the directors general of both UNESCO and DICRO. And um, he, in fact, um, contributed to the launching of the uh, Arab Regional Center of World Heritage in Bahrain. Uh, I would like to, uh, it is different to find the question that can be uh, specifically um, asked when Dr. Munir is, uh, when we are faced with the, with the experience and knowledge of Dr. Munir. So that's why I would like to ask you, Dr. Munir, um, which case, which situation have you found the most challenging and which situation made the um, uh, sort of strongest impact to your understanding of meaning of heritage and the possibility that it is, the heritage is a subject of manipulation and also subject of uh, providing welfare uh, or 
tool of providing the love for the society. Is there a such or such case in the world? Uh, thank you, Amra, for organizing such a wonderful meeting with such wonderful experts. And every day, I think we are learning a lot about this very, very important topic. The fact that uh, uh, during the, you know, the different conflicts, uh, it, it happens that I was sent to Iraq immediately after the war between Iraq and Iran. Uh, I was sent to Lebanon immediately after the Ataif agreement. Uh, I was sent to your country, uh, to Sarajevo and Mostar, and you remember how much we work together. Uh, so I went to uh, Iraq two times uh, uh, after the first, con uh, what we call the Gulf War, first Gulf, Gulf War, and then the second one, which was terrible. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you cannot imagine how uh, the team I, I brought with me to uh, Baghdad after the, you know, the end of the Saddam Hussein regime and how you are faced with the, a museum, with the, the director of museum showing us the, the stores completely empty uh, and crying in front of a museum which was very, very badly destroyed. Uh, same when I went to uh, Kabul uh, after the, the end of the Taliban regime and uh, with the Minister of Culture and some uh, few uh, colleagues uh, from Afghanistan showing uh, how they, all the Buddha statues in the museum, in the store of the ministry were completely damaged and uh, smashed. So the, yes, I think I have seen so much. Uh, uh, I have seen also in Cambodia uh, how the uh, a school was transformed into a museum for genocide. Uh, and it, it was always a kind of first uh, uh, attempt to come on behalf of UNESCO and to see how UNESCO can react in front of such terrible situation. But the one, uh, because we, we have only a few minutes, the one which was really very uh, shocking for me was uh, in uh, end of February, 2001, I was accompanying the Director General of UNESCO, Koichiro Matsura, to my country, Algeria. And I received a, a phone call from my colleague, uh, Lindel Prot, who was at that time the Chief of the Normative Action, Normative uh, Department uh, at UNESCO, saying, you know, Munir, we just heard from the Ambassador of uh, Greece in Kabul, uh, in, in Islamabad, there was not embassy, uh, in uh, Islamabad, that Mullah Omar decided to destroy the two giant Buddha statues in Bamiyan, but he's not doing it immediately. Uh, he, he's saying we will, he, he will give the order to destroy these statues after uh, the uh, holidays of uh, celebrating in the Islamic world the sacrifice of Abraham. So it was exactly 28th of February when we received this, uh, this notice. And Mr. Matsura said, Unir, what do you think if I sent a message? I said, Mr. Director General, I, you, don't, you know this uh, uh, regime uh, chaired by Mullah Omar, uh, head of Taliban, they don't recognize anyone. And uh, a, a message from UNESCO will be uh, put in the basket. I think we have to immediately send uh, a special envoy. And we sent immediately on the 2nd of March, uh, the former ambassador of France to Islamabad and former teacher of the languages of Central Asia, like Pashtun, Dari, uh, and his name is very famous because he has a very easy name. His name is Pierre La France, and he's ambassador of France. He, he was a friend of mine because I, I was working uh, on the international campaign of Mohenjo Daro in Pakistan on the site of Taxila. So I usually saw him at the French embassy and he was uh, immediately saying, I will go to, to speak to the Taliban. And we sent this mission immediately, uh, helped by the Ministry of uh, Interior of Pakistan, because of course uh, there was no flight direct to go to uh, Kandahar. 
And then he called me from uh, Kandahar saying, you know, Munir, I am not the man. What is uh, at stake is a religious problem. I said, a religious problem? Yes, uh, I'm going back. Uh, I will go through Saudi Arabia where I was uh, ambassador. I will try to see if in Saudi Arabia they can convince the Taliban not to do this kind of destruction. But I think you have to check for someone else. So I spent, uh, and I have a, a colleague who is uh, still working at UNESCO, and she can tell you how we spent the uh, remaining days before uh, the aid, uh, Paola Leoncini Bartoli. Uh, she was, uh, I was at that time assistant director general for culture. I'm uh, from uh, Muslim culture. The, the director general of UNESCO is a Japanese from Buddhist culture. And so it was really a, a, a real problem to see how are we going to face this situation. So we started to organize a meeting with all uh, ambassadors of the Islamic countries, uh, like uh, you know, Ersika or something like that. And we explained to them what is going on. They did the de declaration. Uh, and then I thought, no, I think we have to face this situation with religious people. So I organized. Uh, a phone call between Koichiro Matsura, the director general of UNESCO, with the president of Egypt, uh, President Mubarak. Uh, Allah Yerhamu, he's not anymore in this world. And Koichiro Matsura said, but what should I ask to President Mubarak? I said, please Dr. ask him, Dr. I finish. Uh, please ask him if we can send Sheikh Al-Azhar, that means the highest religious authority in the Islamic world, because we don't have a church and we don't have a, a hierarchy in, in Islam. And we organized a mission of religious people to Kandahar. This is the situation which was for me so uh, tense, so uh, frustrating, because we didn't succeed. We sent 14 people with Sheikh Al-Azhar, with Mufti Masr, and lawyers, specialists in Islamic law, and they were not able to convince Mullah Omar about this situation. So this is, in brief, uh, a situation that we lived with my colleagues, uh, and in particular, uh, Paola Leoncini Bartoli. You cannot imagine the number of calls, the number of contacts we, we have during this short period. And then what we saw by the television, the destruction of the two uh, Buddha statues. This is something that you cannot forget when you are in charge and when you have all the ambassadors of Japan, Sri Lanka, India uh, uh, coming to see me. I said, what are you doing? Uh, uh, are you doing some kind of protection for this uh, heritage, which is so important for, for, for us? So this is in brief, because it's a long story, but I, I really try to, to tell you that in my career, 25 years in UNESCO, having done, unfortunately, I must say, all the, all the crises, this is the one that struck me a lot. Yeah, it's very frustrating, but it, it is also good to see that there is one frustrating situation, that the others are some kind of success that you can talk about. Yes. yes, I mean, when I went to Mostar and it was a city, a ghost city, and I arrived with the Spanish army of the UN, yes, it, it was also a shock. But, you know, when I met you, I met Senada, the, pa the father of Senada, uh, uh, later Demirovic, and when I was able to convince the two mayors that UNESCO can do something, but it has to be done within the spirit of collaboration and dialogue between the communities. And the two mayors, I, this is a testimony that I wrote uh, about it, is that both said, okay, uh, the, the one of the objects that you should uh, help restore is the bridge of Mostar. And this is the satisfaction, because it's not only a destruction that it is you know, shocking you when you see this ghost city, and I have terrible pictures like you, uh, but also to see that, uh, as you remember, you worked uh, on this with uh, uh, Demirovic and others, and we have seen that the three uh, experts 
joining the, the international group of experts was one Bosnian, was Croat, and one Serbian. So we were thinking that this was a way to reach what is the ideals that all our texts are ecomos and uh, uh, ikrom and uh, etc. about cultural heritage and the relation with peace and intercultural dialogue. Very important story. I'm so sorry for uh, the time restrictions. I know, I know. <laughs> we, we have to do another meeting where yeah, I can. Of course, of course. We have no to longer talk at the about end. also the good stories in Yemen, yeah. the international campaign in Sana, in Shiba, oh, etc. Yeah. etc. However, I, I, let me now um, introduce Dr. Shadi Atukhan who in fact was a director of the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage during the period 2017 and 2021, uh, when these, uh, the inception of this project in fact took place. And uh, uh, she has directed and implemented the comprehensive program for the revitalization of the old city of Jerusalem, which I, uh, bared my witness to as well and uh, was and had a pleasure to collaborate with her at that project. She won the Aga Khan Award for the architecture in 2004 for that project. Uh, Shadia is now the chairperson of the Committee for Culture and Revitalization of Heritage in Palestine as a member of the board of uh, Tavun Welfare Association, a Swiss-based Palestinian or organization. And in fact, I would like to ask you, uh, Ashadia, something that is uh, somehow, I know, a personal story. I, uh, thanks to you, I had the opportunity to visit frequently in Naples, and it became some kind of my second hometown because I found a lot of Bosnian clings in, uh, in Naples and a lot of Bosnian heritage there. Uh, one of the most beautiful palaces there is a wonderful residential complex of Al Khan family, very famous family in Nablus, uh, which was severely damaged and part of it desolated. Um, and uh, having in mind that you, in fact, led some of the projects of the reconstruction of some of the residential areas, residential complexes, El Fosh, uh, 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 complexes in uh, Nablus. Can you give an example how the uh, reconstruction of these destroyed, desolated houses and the adaptive reuse for the uh, uh, contemporary uh, demands of people uh, can in fact um, have a sort of potential in social and economic recovery of Palestinians living in their land. Can you give us an example of the restoration project you've been working on in your Nablus? Yes, thank you so much, Amra. I thank you for um, all your efforts and this uh, wonderful um, um, conference that you have uh, contributed largely for its success with uh, a um, great team uh, of uh, ARCWH in Bahrain, and uh, it's coming along that much, much more, more uh, kind of uh, um, impressive than we originally thought. We had some uh, ideas, uh, you and I and the team, in the early stages before COVID and, and uh, all the interruption that uh, as Trevor just said, we were planning to bring in, if it was going to be carried out in Bahrain, to bring in some people who have experienced uh, from the community, uh, whether it's from Yemen or Iraq or, or elsewhere, to, to be part of, of the discussion. It didn't help. Maybe you will, you will have to arrange another one then. And uh, your, your work in, uh, in Palestine in helping building the capacity of professionals in both uh, Jerusalem and Nablus and other cities uh, is, uh, is amazing and very much appreciated. And we hope it can continue or you're, you're doing it now online, but maybe one day you'll be back in Al-Haram Sharif and in Jerusalem and come to Nablus. 
what I want to say is basically to go back to um, the opening or, or the first before the session. Uh, when we were talking, uh, when my my introduction was something to deal with the community and whether we as professionals, architects, engineers, anthropologists, and, and so on, do we really uh, understand the impact of uh, the trauma um, on uh, the community? And if we understand it, do we do we uh, are we capable of doing something really concrete about it rather than just end up with as, as Trevor and Rohit maybe mentioned, that it will be a paper decision, um, people-centered approach, community participation, bottom-up um, approach and, and all that. We want to see what, I just want to come uh, to, oh, to uh, uh, this example that we worked on in Nablus especially. And I'm sure you have visited when it was completed and maybe during. Uh, the restoration. It, it was, uh, it just carried all the difficulties and all the problems that uh, as professionals we would face. Um, it was uh, um, after the uh, very extensive damage that um, um, happened to the historic urban fabric in, in Nablus due to Israeli incursion and bombardment of a number of buildings and particularly houses as well, and also some, some soap factories. Uh, and um, how we dealt with one of the most uh, difficult residential complexes, which was completely destroyed. Um, the old city of Nablus is on, on Jersey mountain and it's, it's a very steep mountain. So the buildings are, the, each complex uh, is built on two, three levels as you build against the, the mountain. So when this um, uh, residential complex completely fell down and, and one of the families uh, died underneath the rubble and all that, we thought we would start with this one because of the, of the magnitude of, of the um, damage and the effect on the community. And there were other houses that we thought this one was, uh, uh, will become a model for us to learn from as well. We work in, in other cities, mainly in the old city of Jerusalem. We, we work with the community all the time. It's a tough community, but I mean, if you don't work, take them on your side, you're not gonna do anything uh, right, you know? So we had this little experience, but there to start to deal with 17 families uh, completely traumatized, members of the family of all generations, anger and anxiety, uh, despair and worry about this could happen again and why did it happen and so on. So Ta'awun, which is a non-government organization, Palestinian one based in, in Switzerland, uh, we deal with the social as well as, as the physical and they have a special program for uh, historic centers. Um, so we, we, we didn't know what to do to rebuild because it was part of a condensed ur old urban fabric that goes back hundreds of years. And Ottoman upon Mamluk and, and all these layers. Uh, and we didn't have plans, we didn't have any documentation and all we have to do is just talk to the community. So we started to work with them with the help of some community leaders and some um, young architects and engineers from the university and those who, who, who work and live in the old city. And starting with removing the debris, and that was one of the most difficult things because you're removing people's lives and dreams and you find their um, uh, picture frames and uh, kids' school uh, uh, books and, and so on. So we worked with them to remove it as well as try to save the, um, stones that were destroyed. Now we came to, to the more critical technically is who lived where and the seven, where were the, the lines and the borders between um, each unit and where did family have and in, in, in these areas, even in, in, in projects in the old city of uh, Jerusalem and in Hebron, families share a bathroom and um, you know, they, they, they share the same steps between one room and another and all that. So we have to deal with this complexity and we didn't know what to do. So one of the thing we, we thought as a team is 
to start asking, uh, we had this piece of land, which is empty. And after we, you know, we stored the remaining stones to use them uh, again, uh, where possible. And we had, we had to sit in somebody's office and, and bring the families and all of them first and tell them what we try to do and what is it that we don't know. And without them, we cannot do anything. So uh, we started with drawing um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the buildings and who was where and in and what level. It took months, I'm telling you, it wasn't easy. And then we had with us from the university, uh, the School of Architecture, um, some of the students came and created a model. And this model uh, was discussed and, and first presented to the families. And then there were disagreement, no, my door is from here, no that, and, and so on. And then finally we agreed on a model. And then at the same time, parallel to that, we were trying to find documents of who owns what and who was a tenant and who was an owner and who was a sub, sub-tenant or, or whatever. And uh, finally, uh, the thing is that you are building, it's an answer between uh, other, other houses and residential complexes in this long street. And if I'm talking about one, one, one house, it's what, what we call a, a residential complex, you can repeat that for hundreds if you're talking about Aleppo or Sana'a or, or Mosul or something. So I'm just giving you um, um, an, a small example of how long did it take for us to with the community and they, we encouraged them. We had it done in three phases with three contractors and we had to introduce every contractor and put in his, in his brief that he has to work with and, and be patient with, with the residents when, when they give their opinion and say, no, not this one, not that one. And sometimes they have disagreement. This is the nature of people, you know, you don't, you can't, I mean, this is, we're not talking about a monument, we're not talking about a mosque, we're not talking about um, a church uh, or, or a mosque or bridge. This is life. These are people who live in these um, uh, places for years and years and years. Like you mentioned, the family uh, house, the Tukan family house. We, we lived in it like my, my family 500, six years ago. So you have all this history there and you cannot touch it except if the owners or the users or whatever have a say in it. And then when we talk, put on paper and say people centered, we have to understand what does it mean? Uh, as Rohit said, when you, when you, when you use the term um, uh, resilience, it could be used like, you know, it's something which is fashionable, you know, it's a trendy thing to say, people's resident, uh, resilience, their perseverance and that, but it means a lot. And, it differs from one place to another, depending on the context, depending on the culture and the background of the community. And as we, we, we heard yesterday in the excellent session in the morning um, that Trevor, I think, was uh, chairing, it, uh, you, each, each conflict comes in a different, for a different reason, in a different context, uh, in a different shape. And um, it, it, you have to understand all this, but before you start uh, thinking about it. For us, it was also the worry about where would these families go? Some of them had relatives who took, took them in and others, the Welfare Association, then, which is the town in Arabic. It, it I'm so sorry, I, I just have the, uh, the time is not our friend. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, what, I, what I want to say at the end, you know, it's a far more complex thing. That's it. Thank you. In fact, uh, I visit social Shobi. I, I, I talk to people who, in fact, uh, reclaim their homes there after it was restored. And maybe it's the first example that I have seen of building back better after Thank something. Else. Yeah. So um, now uh, I would like to uh, important person to me uh, during these uh, last recent two years of um, my work, uh, my colleague, Mohamed Ziyan Bouzian, 
uh, he's a, an architect by training with degrees in territories and heritage professions and conservation and management of cultural landscapes from three European universities. He joined the UNESCO World Heritage Center where he specialized in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention and worked particularly on urban conservation and the implementation of historic urban landscape recommendation. Muhammad in 2017 joined the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage as a senior program specialist in charge of the design and the implementation of the cultural heritage program. He has contributed to a number of publications on cultural heritage in both Arabic and English, and he has been working actively on a daily basis on this project uh, during recent two years. I would like to start this uh, circle, the second sort of uh, round uh, that is concluding round with a question that I will um, uh, put to uh, Muhammad. Uh, how do you see the theme of post-trauma reconstruction and uh, integrated recovery in the future work of Arab Regional Center, Muhammad? Thank you. Thank you very much, Amra, for, for this introduction. And I would like also to uh, convey my, my gratitude to all the speakers for their excellent intervention all over the three last days. Uh, in fact, uh, it is a very relevant question, and thank you very much for asking it, because it's a topic that we are uh, debating at the center and that we would like, you know, to uh, have the... Um, uh, the best of the role that we can have uh, in the future, especially. Uh, ArcWH is uh, category two centers that, is, uh, that was established at the beginning of an era which is sadly known as the uh, Arab Spring or uh, the uh, new kind of uh, revolution that resulted in some conflict in some countries. And uh, the mandate of the center is to uh, work with the Arab states in collaboration with the World Heritage Center to uh, the effective implementation of the World Heritage Convention. Obviously, from the beginning, the center worked on uh, three axes, mainly uh, capacity building in all fields related to the conservation of cultural heritage and the management of heritage, but also on the uh, building of knowledge or the translation of documents into Arabic. And we are working on something uh, which is uh, building a body of knowledge or collecting a body of knowledge in relation to the uh, reconstruction and recovery or post-trauma recovery or the integrated recovery, including the socioeconomic aspects. And then the participation of local communities or participation of civil society in the protection and conservation of heritage. So one of the main uh, aspects which we can intervene in the integrated reconservation, integrated conservation, integrated recovery phase would be really to continue helping in developing the body of knowledge and research in the field of recovery. And this conference and the book that we are working on and also other uh, kind of intervention in this field through the, trans the, the translation of documents that were produced by the advisory bodies, by ECOMOS, ICROM, and also UNESCO in the field of reconstruction, but also other uh, topics which can be linked to the field of recovery is one uh, of the, um, uh, one of the uh, intervention that we can have and is in our strategy, something that we are really uh, aiming to uh, continue in. Something which is also very, uh, important is that the center is working in the field closer to the Arab states in our region and working with uh, the partners at the local level in developing uh, strategies for recovery phases with countries that are at the end of a conflict or countries are in the middle of a conflict is something that is important for us and uh, my colleague uh, May is uh, with us. We were working during the last two years also on the third cycle of the periodic reporting and it was uh, highlighted by the state parties through the focal points and site managers as one of the main um, 
main outcomes and integrated into the action plan. And this is something that we can help in and we would like to be really uh, having some uh, concrete interventions with countries through developing uh, strategies for the recovery and mainly strategies that are focusing on human-centered approaches, on people-centered approaches, if you may, or if you'd like to ask them. But I would like also here to highlight the fact that we are talking about local communities and Joe on the first day uh, mentioned how much it is difficult to, talk to, to, uh, to, to work with local communities sometimes. But uh, I uh, would like also to highlight the fact that we are working with local communities, but we are also working with people that are heritage professionals uh, that could be um, working under umbrella of official institutions or uh, NGOs that are experts locally based. And these people are also struggling and suffering. And we can uh, see this when we meet with them outside their country most of the time. They uh, can be broken, they can be very uh, affected, and they sometimes need really to express themselves and to talk. They are working to mobilize resources. They are working to also uh, keep it up with requests for, for instance, for World Heritage Sites with regard to the reporting on, on, the, on, the, on the effects of, uh, of the conflict, but also they need to report on other projects that are being implemented by different partners. And these people are, for us, really the link uh, we work with communities, but them they are they are in a very delicate position. They are not considered as local communities. They are officials, but they are not only officials. They are people that are the the main resources that we have uh, or in, in 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 place, and we need really to work with them. And that's why we uh, in our uh, strategy and following up on the uh, result of the third cycle of the periodic reporting, we would like to uh, continue one of main, our, our main axes in one of our main axes of work, which is capacity building, which was identified as a transversal thematic into the, in, 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 the, in the action plan of the periodic reporting in the Arab states. And this capacity building can be on um, risk mitigation, on management of uh, risk, on uh, recovery on conservation and rehabilitation. And these people that are, I am talking about, they are really inspiring and they are really, uh, uh, for us, uh, the monuments men on the field, in the field. They are uh, working hand on hand with people, with local communities. But at the same time, because most of them lost many of their colleagues because of population displacement, there are something like in French called hemorrhagic expertise or bleeding of expertise. So they need also themselves to build their capacities and they are really eager to develop capacities in this field of conservation, of risk management and risk, uh, risk, risk mitigation. Work that uh, we are also willing to continue in is the collaboration with advisory bodies and we really appreciate our positive uh, uh, collaboration with the three of them, including also with the World Heritage Center in uh, different fields, uh, first aid, conservation, management, and also the development of uh, impact assessment studies, which is something really important when we are talking about countries that are in need of infrastructures, development countries where sites have been destroyed and where major conservation and restoration projects uh, need to be conducted. So we need also to work on this with the, with the, with the state parties and with the, this main category of professionals that are in the field with, uh, whom, with whom we are really, uh, we really need to develop and to invest in them. And at the end, I would like also to mention that as a center, category two center, we will continue being a platform for uh, technical and financial support with all the partners, the regional partners, the international partners, because we are close to the field, because we work uh, directly with state parties. We have a huge network of experts, of colleagues, of NGOs working with us in the field. And then, uh, Maybe one of the aspects would be also to continue res mobilizing resources and collaborating with some donors in, uh, at the international level to implement projects and to facilitate their implementation. Uh, we have really 
will to continue in this field and potential partners are Alif, UNESCO, World Bank and, 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 and many others. So this is maybe in a nutshell, what, how we see our, uh, our, our intervention or our role in developing, uh, in, 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 in helping, assisting uh, countries in the Arab region in the recovery phase. Thank you, thank you so much, Mohammed, for this very sort of uh, promising and optimistic uh, uh, sort of program that you presented. We learn now, this from, from, from the people in the field. They are always positive and full of hope and they transmitted their uh, positivity to us. Great. So now I will gratefully request the chairs, five chairs of the sessions to present a summary uh, of the most important issues raised during the sessions that they have chaired. So if I can start, and I, I would like to say that the summaries will be integrated into the final document of the conference. So if I can start with uh, uh, Marilor Lavenir, who chaired the first session. Can you please present the conclusions from the first session? Thank uh, Can you please unmute yourself? Sorry, yeah. And start yes. from the yeah. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, thank you, Amra. Yes, the key points and summaries of the first session were, well, first we said that reconstruction is a word that covers multiple meanings, that it's sometimes easier to define what it is not or what it should not be only. We asked ourselves if reconstruction could be a wicked problem, as uh, Lecrine explained to us. Uh, we said that reconstruction is not only an act of retrieval, but also an act of creation or even an act of co-creation. From an economic perspective, we said that co-creation could lead us to the concept of innovation and reconstruction is about recreating value, usage value, public value, and um, which relies on innovation, like all creation value processes. We said also that um, as construction is meant to allow transmission or translation from past to future, it's important that younger generations are involved hence the importance of education, capacity building. Uh, we said, yes, that lessons learned from experience um, teaches that people-centered approaches are the only way forward. But as uh, Mohamed said, it's not an easy way because we can observe that articulation of people-centered approaches with agency-led reconstruction is almost always a key challenge. And then we said that um, Mario told us that digital technologies offer a power tool for reconstruction, in particular regarding impact assessments and documentation. But uh, he said that they raise also their own ethical questions. Uh, yes, I think that's a good wrap up of uh, what was said during our very rich and very interesting session. Thank you, thank you so much for this wonderful summary. That is extremely useful for the uh, drafting the final document. Now I would like to invite Rohit to share the summary, share with us his summary of the session that he chaired. Thank you very much, uh, Amra. So uh, our session was titled Building Resilience in Recurrent and Mutually Superimposed Trauma. And we had five very, very exciting presentations. Uh, we had four, though we had five papers. Uh, but they were all very, very stimulating. Uh, so the key points were, uh, one of the important aspect is to, uh, to not look at one narrative, but consider multiple narratives in, uh, with regards to understanding heritage values. Uh, it's also important to uncover and discover hidden values and communicate these as these may resonate with communities and thus keep up the momentum of recovery. Uh, it was also mentioned that it is uh, significant to develop and create new values during the recovery process because values are not static. Uh, Mazen, through his uh, paper, mentioned about war, scar war scars and uh, that, that it is so important to uh, keep the evidence of these conflicts 
uh, by citing the case of National Museum of Beirut, he stressed that the evidence of past conflicts must not be covered up, but accepted as part of the historicity of a place. Uh, of course, removing what is necessary is uh, to ensure stability and protection of a place. Uh, so it's important that the trauma is not forgotten and we need to draw lessons from the past in order to build, rebuild the future. Uh, recovery and reconstruction efforts through the case of uh, Yemen, we were, we were told that for urban heritage, we should take into consideration all the challenges faced by the people who inhabited and contribute to its survival. Therefore, recovery and reconstruction should contribute towards reducing vulnerability of heritage and its people. And that was the key, that it's not just heritage, but heritage is really the essence of what people are. And so we must think about reducing vulnerability of both heritage and people to all types of heritage to which they are exposed. So a holistic view is really required to ensure sustainability. And it was also very much mentioned that intangible aspects of heritage should be considered for determining recovery and uh, reconstruction process and authenticity of the process is as important as the product that we want to have at the as the final, and this was through the case of Kasubi tombs. Uh, in the case of Zanzibar in Tanzania, uh, what we were told uh, very importantly was the recovery and reconstruction should take into consideration deep rooted underlying social, economic, and political vulnerability factors. Uh, these factors exaggerate the risk to heritage and therefore efforts should go beyond mere physical restoration of damaged heritage and involve efforts towards reconciliation and sustainable development. The last presentation on Aleppo, Syria was really uh, about sustainable recovery in post-conflict uh, context, which should ensure economic regeneration along with physical reconstruction. And this would necessitate uh, placing culture at the core of overall recovery process and engaging local community in all phases. Uh, well, uh, though it is difficult to engage community, it is the most important part that we must ensure. And we must look at new uses and alternate uses uh, so that the economic regeneration process can be facilitated. And this may require coordination with between agencies, uh, different kinds of stakeholders, non, uh, including nonprofits and multinational agencies. So uh, just to conclude, uh, uh, we had two very good uh, commentators and uh, they were really reflecting on it. And they mentioned that the rigorous evaluation, this was George who mentioned that rigorous evaluation of impact is necessary across all areas of heritage and there's a need to build an evidence base for what works best in building resilience against trauma so that funding can be deployed more effectively to back effective programs and he was referring to his own program uh, which he has been uh, leading uh, uh, which is called Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. And lastly, uh, uh, Rand aptly mentioned that there should be an intolerance towards intolerance. I think that was a very key point that he mentioned. And if anyone is involved with a different agenda or seeking to view things from a primarily political point of view, uh, uh, while regenerating negative history, they should not be involved. So we need to have a positive out outlook and energy, and that should be included in recovery and reconstruction efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rohit, for this. And now I would like to invite Trevor to uh, inform us about the conclusions of the session number three. Thank you, Amra. Um, I quite like that, Rohit, intolerance of intolerance. I think that's quite powerful and something that we need to take on board. Um, I, um, I think I was privileged to, um, to chair a panel with remarkable presentations and also reflections from the three commentators. Um, Amra, as you know, I sent you three very full pages of what I thought were keynotes that I, I identified in the talks yesterday. So um, I'm going to summarize that and just bring out a few of the, the ones that I think really shine through, if that's okay. Um, so they're really in point form. I thought the point about the importance of understanding not only what harm was done, but also what made 
that harm possible and continues to make that harm possible is absolutely fundamental to, to understanding. And Dacia Viejo Rose um, provided us with a, uh, a structure to try to, to work through that, to, to better grapple with harm um, in a very useful way and to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, I also thought it was a, a very important point that rather than thinking of recovery and reconstruction as a process with linear progression, it was proposed that we instead think of heritage as existing and operating within an ecosystem with numerous actors and dimensions, including the effective, the emotional, and the political. Amra, your paper was full of um, important points and you already know those so well, um, but there's one that, I, that really struck me, I think, as, um, as extremely important was this focus that you had on fragments, the importance of fragments, and to recognize that fragments of buildings can have the power to stand for the whole, that they have symbolic and material power, and that they can be potent vehicles for constructing narratives, and establishing deeper understanding that contribute to processes of healing and peace building. And so this emphasis that you gave to the small parts that remain, um, I, uh, I, I, I thought was incredibly evocative and also um, very convincing. A couple of other points were that we should recognize that peace is culturally situated. It's not some universal abstract thing, but it is culturally situated. And that it's also vital to challenge the predominant approaches, the idea that heritage can and should be used to construct some unitary narrative, that we need to be aware of that. I also very much appreciated this point from Ellie Harrowell that we need to differentiate between conflict, which in fact can ultimately be productive of creativity if harnessed in the right way, as opposed to violence, which is never desirable. FIDA, I think, brought up a number of, of very important points. And what struck me was her, um, her reflections on the new kinds of heritage and the emerging cultures that can evolve in long-term displacement camps. And that in fact, in this kind of, in this process of trying to bring people back home by disrupting the camps and dismantling them, we have to really be aware of the damage that we might be doing to the heritage that has evolved there in some cases over decades. And this relates to a point made by um, Trinidad Rico um, that we need to apply the same critical thinking that we apply to the perpetrators of conflict and violence to heritage interventions, because heritage interventions may have the power to enact their own kind of violence and erasure of things. So um, I think that uh, that picks up, I think, some of the, the most powerful points that were raised in session three. Amra, you have to Amra. Amra. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, just a small note. Um, uh, I, I have to sort of acknowledge during some of our conversations that we had while we were working on this uh, Ecomas Ikram project. Uh, in fact, we were talking when, when the part stands for hope. And then you suggested the, uh, something from the linguistic studies, the term synecdoche. And in fact, I uh, completed one article that is, I think, now in the press, uh, acknowledging the idea that you gave to me, uh, introducing the term synecdoche to conservation. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, now, I would like to invite Azra to present the summary of the session four. Thank you, Amra. So the session four was titled People-Centered Post-Trauma Reconstruction and Recovery of Cultural Heritage. Uh, we had um, 
papers that um, presented case studies uh, and that looked at the transformative capacity of cultural heritage and its recovery in the process of social healing. And these papers encompassed uh, case studies that uh, looked at different types of uh, causes of destructions from uh, natural disasters um, such as earthquakes in Nepal and Albania to the deliberate destruction of cultural heritage um, as in cases of Balkans, Cambodia, Iraq, Yemen, and, and Syria. Uh, there are some um, shared concerns of all panelists. Uh, the first is that the, everyone agrees that cultural heritage and its recovery is really crucial for the social healing of affected communities because it um, allows for a kind of recovery of the sense of identity, belonging, cultural heritage connects one to, to a territory and also to community, gives a sense of normality in the process of reconstruction. And so the panelists agree that it is really important to find ways to capture and nurture these social dimensions and meanings of cultural heritage in, in the process of recovery. Another shared concerns uh, of, of the panelists was the question of the ethics of uh, recovery processes. And um, in this context, everyone has um, kind of made a point that cultural heritage evaluation is highly contextual. So we need to think about um, you know, whose conceptions of conservation should be actually applied to which context? Are the Western approaches applicable to all contexts? And uh, what about taking into account local traditions and ways of uh, perceiving and, um, and, and methods of, of preserving heritage? So uh, an agreement here is that no, there is no one fit all solutions and answer. Uh, um, everyone agrees that people-centered approaches are highly contextual and they also depend on local traditions and need to integrate them. Now, uh, there are a couple of challenges that were brought up in the panels um, that these people-centered approaches require a deep understanding of local knowledge, cultural practices, materials, traditions, because they are so highly contextually. Um, it means also knowing and kind of connecting with people on the ground. And these processes are often very complex and difficult to organize. They take several years and need to establish trust relationships. But also you have to know regional politics. And, um, you know, there is this concern how then uh, external experts could work in such contexts. It does require collaborations with the local population. Uh, the differences of destruction do matter in these processes. It's very different if you have a kind of natural disaster and you're working in this kind of context versus a war caused um, genocidal type of warfare destruction, which adds additional emotional burden on affected communities that uh, makes also these recovery processes very meaningful, but also quite challenging because you are dealing with trauma of the, of the population. Some questions that came out of the panels are, I mean, really essential question uh, that we always need to be asking ourselves is what is to be restored and to what end is this about the material dimensions and symbolism versus um, um, social values and social structures embedded in uh, cultural heritage. And then another question is also how does then this um, social significance restoration uh, inform the economic development and political development of uh, areas that affected by destruction, you know, what is the weighing and a kind of, uh, of these. In the reflections, we stress that the, it's really important to learn from the lessons and from the field work and from uh, these different uh, um, uh, types of projects. Uh, a long-term impact of people-centered approaches as put in question. It is a challenge and how do we, you know, I mean, also for ethical reasons, you need to kind of keep going and, and, and monitoring and developing these types of approaches. Another concern brought up was, uh, and the dilemma that I think is also faced in any kind of uh, conservation project is the expert driven versus um, uh, people on the ground driven uh, type of approach especially when it comes to disasters and post-war recovery. 
people want to hurry up and establish a sense of normalcy in everyday life and in those contexts then uh, kind of these dilemmas and clashes between experts and and um, called non-experts emerge okay so uh i think this summarizes some of the, the questions and i thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention Thank you, thank you very much, Azra, for both sharing and summarizing your session. And now, can I ask me to um, present the conclusions from the session five? Thank you, Amra. Uh, actually, yeah, we had the fifth session this morning. Um, I will mention a few points and the takeaways from the, the session. I couldn't, you know, put it. Uh, you know, in a, in a well, let's say, coherent summary, but I hope this will help. So uh, basically, uh, from the first uh, presentation by Munir Bouchnaki, uh, the importance of political will in strategic and integrated reconstruction was very much stressed upon and illustrated in the example of uh, Angor. Uh, it illustrated how putting heritage sites, when, when, it, when heritage is put at the top of uh, the priorities, uh, this can contribute to successful recovery or reconstruction processes, which of course may, may be done uh, then by participatory approaches, but at the end of the day, he very much stressed the point of political will. Um, incidentally, this is also one of the points that was uh, referred to, mentioned in the Alif presentation. Um, and in terms of uh, the challenges with reconstruction, uh, again, the critical importance of political will was highlighted uh, by the presentation of Alexandra on behalf of Alif. Um, challenges that were mentioned uh, in terms of uh, integrated recovery uh, were related to, of course, security and stability in, in certain contexts, and this is uh, very well, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's clear and, and noted. Uh, the importance of training uh, in the processes as well, and, and training, you know, can be part of community engagement as well, but it's very important to have um, qualified uh, personnel in the processes, and this was illustrated by several uh, examples of projects uh, that are being implemented uh, through uh, the support of Elif. Uh, the involvement of communities was very much highlighted in the actual reconstruction uh, uh, process. And uh, um, specifically the importance of coordination and breaking down barriers, uh, what was very uh, important uh, in order to, to work with uh, with communities um, and so on. And, and so basically, um, engagement and will needs to be uh, at the two levels, at the level of the political will uh, by decision makers and, uh, and, and policy makers, but also at the level of uh, community engagement and also not only in the decision making process, but also in the process of uh, um, rebuilding or reconstruction and recovery. Um, social and economic impact can be through job uh, creation uh, as such. And also the, the point that heritage uh, and protection of heritage and, and re recovery of heritage can be an occasion for, for dialogue between uh, different uh, cultures uh, and so on. Um, the presentation of Alif also uh, mentioned the new emerging challenges of climate change and COVID-19 uh, that were that that uh, came up, uh, you know, uh, recently. COVID-19 came recently, but also the issue of climate change and how heritage reconstruction can help in mitigating the impact of uh, climate uh, change. And um, and also the, the the necessity of using traditional techniques, traditional materials. This is a very important uh, aspect uh, in the recovery process that needs to be taken into consideration and and studied in every case. Um, then there is a need for international mobilization, and this was uh, also uh, a very important point that was raised. Um, Alida's presentation mentioned uh, two major, let's say, challenges or let's say uh, shortcomings, basically. Uh, the first is the failure to foresee and prevent damage to heritage sites. 
And the second one is to the failure to manage the process with an integrated approach that would take into account socioeconomic factors and social participation in post-conflict reconstruction. And while it is uh, good to talk about this and to highlight the importance of uh, taking into to account socioeconomic factors and social participation, it is not always uh, easy and sometimes uh, you, you know, it, it, it does not uh, happen or work. Uh, nevertheless, he, he presented some um, good case studies, especially from Bosnia Herzegovina and so on in, the, in this uh, process, in implementing this process. Um, the presentation of Magdalena, uh, Magdalena was uh, focused on uh, socioeconomic, you know, focused on first the analysis of uh, the so-called uh, soft law instruments, um, and uh, took, uh, uh, you know, through basically uh, looking at socioeconomic aspects of cultural heritage recovery and reconstruction uh, in um, documents such as the Commons Charters, as well as recommendations such as the Historic Urban Landscape Recommendation and the Warsaw Recommendation. Uh, referring to them as soft law instruments. And while uh, these aspects are, are not mentioned or rarely mentioned in, uh, in legislation, uh, they can be found in such uh, instruments. And, um, and it's interesting to see how the progression of the reference to reconstruction in these instruments through time uh, where uh, by the time of the Riga Charter, uh, there is a wider concept of reconstruction that uh, talks about uh, exceptional cases uh, of reconstruction. While in previous documents, there was some address about reconstruction uh, impacting authenticity and integrity and so on. So um, there was mention about how conservation policy has evolved through time, over time, and aspects of authenticity and integ integrity have also been charged with new meaning uh, that include intangible attributes of values recognized in post-trauma recovery. And this is really a very interesting aspect that, you know, also in retrospect, looking at our own personal experiences and myself also, you know, how our, our thinking of reconstruction has changed over the last years and looking at uh, community-centered approaches, at the engagement of communities, what heritage means to communities and how, you know, the, our, you know, somehow norms have, have evolved uh, through time and they are reflected in these instruments to a certain extent. Um, and basically, you know, coming, you know, you know, from this uh, line, uh, during the, um, the reflection uh, segment of the session, um, Ahmed uh, Waida talked about the CURE framework, uh, the position, basically the, the UNESCO World Bank position, pa uh, uh, position paper on, on reconstruction. And uh, and uh, where which places culture at the heart of recovery and considers traditions, community perceptions in recovery processes, and this is also again it's it's uh, you know it's it's a witness to the evolving concept of reconstruction and how more and more we are looking into people centered approaches, place based approaches, and it provide and he provided you know in his intervention. Um, uh, some key principles such as the engagement of communities, culture being at the center of uh, reconstruction processes. And um, he closed by mentioning that uh, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the, the recommendations that, that he would like to, to mention is that is, is, you know, once reconstruction starts, especially after a big crisis or a conflict in a post-conflict to focus on perhaps a landmark that is uh, important to all communities and that could help bring you know a communities in in the in the discussion in the reconstruction process and so on as um, a trigger you know for uh, the recovery and taking into consideration uh, perceptions of communities and and uh, and having them play a role in, in the recovery process. 
uh, the early warning systems and, systems and emergency response were also highlighted uh, as uh, by Zainab as important uh, first steps uh, in recovery. And she talked about her work with the uh, ICORP uh, committee, ECOMOS committee, and, and the subcommittee that has been uh, created um, to look at, at these issues. And uh, the session concluded with uh, Senada's intervention about uh, her work with communities, especially uh, young people. And uh, she highlighted the importance of uh, participatory processes and how it is important to gain understanding of heritage um, in the context of also understanding the identity and basically, you know, placing, you know, or understanding what is the identity basically of uh, our identity through heritage and what, what it means, this heritage, and, um, and how the uh, uh, community-based uh, uh, projects are very important in the process uh, of recovery. And this is in a short uh, summary of the session. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It's all of you. Uh, the session. I am uh, the worst time manager. Uh, it is a total failure. We are behind our time. But uh, I have been faced with such an energy, such experience and knowledge that I, I really did not want to ask anyone. anyone to shorten and excuse me, uh, I would like to ask my colleagues to excuse me for sometimes reminding them on the pressure of time that we have. So I would like to ask you for a patience for another 10 to 15 minutes to close the conference. I would like to express my gratitude to all the participants at the three webinars and to this conference, and especially to the chairs of the session, uh, all the um, uh, summaries that we have received and also inputs individuals that we have received from the speakers and uh, our colleagues that participated in the reflection sessions uh, will be integrated into the final document. This is a huge synergic document produced by 50 persons participating at this conference, and I hope that it will have some impact. Once when the draft of the document, when all these is combined, we send it for your final commands before disseminating it publicly. There are many people I want to thank individually. I owe special depth of gratitude for the most sincere collegial support anyone working on the protection of heritage could hope for to Dr. Monir Bushnyaki and Dr. Mechtild Rossler. Both Dr. Bushnyaki and Dr. Rossler, Rossler are friends who have unfailingly responded to any question or request without delay and been ready with useful advice and encouraging support whenever needed. Uh, without wishing to do an injustice to anyone, I simply cannot leave out the names of some of the most important individuals project. Who in fact, initiated the project. I would like to thank Dr. Tukan for the faith she, she has shown in me and for the personal experience which she brought to the project and her constant support for my research and work. Then I um, would like, uh, of course, uh, to mention Mohamed Zian Bozian, with whom I have been in contact on a practically daily basis on all sorts of issues, resolving both conceptual and technical uh, quandaries. He has played his part in every step and phase of the project from its inception to the end. The other team members from ArcWH have also helped make this true with our professional, professionalism and our steady monitoring of the project. Nor can I fail to mentioned the exceptionally important role of such dear colleagues as Hansa Mokdat, Leila Yafi, and Selma Kassan. Thank you.
to our interpret interpretator, Azar Salam, who invested not only her knowledge, but emotions in her, into her task. She confessed to me that she was crying while translating some of the presentations and who has become dear friend of mine. Sheikh Ibrahim El Khalifa has also followed our work on organizing the conference and the webinars from initial conception to final product. His participation in every step of the way has been a particularly welcome affirmation of this project's importance for realizing the ARC WH's mission. I now would like to invite Sheikh Ibrahim Al Khalifa, Deputy Director of ARC WH, to close the conference with an announcement. And thank you very much for your participation and attention. Thank you, Dr. Amra. Thank you so much for all your efforts and guidance towards the, over two years in accomplishing this very important initiative. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Shadia for her vision and for her support and uh, really for uh, starting this initiative back in 2019. It all started over lunch. We had a discussion all together and she had this vision of really transforming the concept of reconstruction and involving uh, local uh, communities and to make sure that this is um, shared with others through this platform. It was an initiated to have, to have been in Bahrain. We would have loved to have you all with us here. But unfortunately, due to the circumstances, it was nearly impossible to host it, uh, to have everyone present. So I think this was a, a kind of a, a replacement that we would like to, to really have something in the future, hopefully here in, 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 in Bahrain. I think the conference uh, integrated reconstruction and post-trauma impact on communities and socioeconomic aspects of recovery has successfully crowned a number of webinars, <clears throat> which Arab Radio Center World Heritage organized between 2020 and 2021. When the project was started in 2019, the aim was to help shift the focus from buildings to people. With the conference, which was already mentioned, planned for April 2020, I think uh, the intention was to bring together prayer experiences, discussions, documents from UNESCO and other international organizations and stakeholders. The COVID-19 pandemic meant putting off the conference while at the same time raising a number of new and important issues related to reconstruction of heritage and the recovery of communities. Measures imposed by the pandemic and a series of catastrophes played a decisive role in giving the overall project a broader scope than initially envisaged. So I think that's again, something that is maybe from the benefits of, of the, of the postmortem is to have something new and to look at it from a different angle as well. Let me make a brief announcement at the end of this session of yet another important part of this project, which is coming soon. As the proceedings of the webinars and the conference, RWH will publish the book, Heritage Reconstruction and People, Integrated Recovery After Trauma. The volume is edited by Dr. Amra. It combines empirical and theoretical knowledge to develop synergies of global and local response to occurrences of heritage destruction and social trauma. The, the destruction of cultural heritage and discussions revolving around rehabilitation are important to more than just the Arab region. But for more than a decade, this region has been the, at the heart of destructive of cultural heritage of which people and the cultural memory have been the chief victims. In academically papers, in academically rigorous papers presented in five thematic groups, 22 chapters, more than 30 authors, contributors to this collection will examine issues of heritage reconstruction in the light of social justice and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The book structure underlines the need for an inclusive interdisciplinary approach to the recovery and rehabilitation of heritage. The authors of the chapters on the connecting heritage and people discuss this from a number of perspectives. If we look at heritage, psychology, heritage law, heritage politics, diplomacy and heritage economics, heritage psychology, heritage rights, and heritage information technologies. This all combined together to really have an academic uh, background and research into, into, into this uh, publication. The Arab Region Center for World Heritage is, is publishing this book as an ex expression of its commitment to developing concrete understanding 
of this particularly demanding and indeed possibly even the most pressing problem associated with how we approach cultural heritage. The social and economic aspects of reconstruction during recovery from social trauma. Dr. Michel Drossler wrote a foreword to the book on September 30, 2021, you can see it on the screen. In, the capacity of, in her capacity as director of UNESCO World Heritage Center, she stated, with its focus on the inclusive and holistic approach to the recovery of heritage and of people after trauma, this book moves forward in the process of building this discourse, whose initial formative contemporary expression was provided in a synergist international decisions, resolutions, and site-specific projects at Angkor, Brovenik, and Mostar during the 90s. Her Excellency Sheikh Hamid Mohammed Al Khalifa, Chairperson of the Governing Board of the Arab Renaissance Center World Heritage, in her foreword to the book, underlined that the contents of this book reaffirm that heritage reconstruction process, the process does need a con have a contribution to and to make a social recovery from trauma, building stable peace and establishing for frameworks for sustainable development. Dear authors of the chapters, let me thank you once again for your valuable contributions to the book and for your continuous support to this project. We look forward to welcoming you at the event of the launch of the book later this year, hopefully in Bahrain. Thank you again and see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheikh Brian. Thank you. And I can say this is the final word of the deputy director of the RWH. See you. I hope to see you all soon. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye. Thank you and bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Lovely. Bye.